experience out of it. Is this? Is this? This is your only experience. Ever. Ever. Your only experience ever. Is this? Some of the sets had the waves that we call the black ones. When they appear and when they loomed, they weren't green or blue, they were just... Traveling for about 12 years on a world tour and done the top 44 and compete against the top guys and seen all the best spot in the world, see JB, Pipeline, Sunset, you know, Fiji, it goes on and on. There's a lot of spot, but um, before I turned professional, I knew the best ways was in Tahiti. Chopu, the first time I went there was in 97, and, and it, the place was just awesome. It was just kind of like a little, you know, piece of heaven. It was like going back in time. There's no uh, cars to drive there. You had to catch a boat to get there, and it was just kind of little bungalows all over the place with a nice waterfall in the back and a stream and family there to uh, take care of you, and um, it was just an awesome, awesome place, and I fell in love with it from the first time I went there.
that wave has changed surfing forever. The name of Chopo is not correct. This is the correct name and the correct uh, pronunciation. Teahupo, and not Teopo. Eh bien, ce district de Teopo, de la Presqu'île, uh, tient son nom uh, d'une bataille qu'il y a eu entre des attaquants venus de la Grande Île, donc de Tahiti, et particulièrement des Teva, donc de Papara, les attaquer chez eux. Et donc, euh, ils vont si bien se défendre qu'ils vont tuer tous leurs agresseurs. Et ils vont les décapiter, et ils vont récupérer les têtes, donc, et pour marquer la limite de leur euh, terre et de leur lieu de résidence avec le reste, ils vont utiliser ces têtes pour en faire un mur de délimitation. Et voilà le sens de Teahoub O, le mur constitué de têtes de ces guerriers battus et tués par eux. The first person who served here in Teahoub O was a girl. And this girl, the name of this girl was uh, Vihiatua. Vihiatua means the uh, coat of God. The name of this pass is Hawa'e. And the name where people are surfing, we all say, everybody say Teopo, it's not Teopo, it's Perirure. And this girl gave that name to that place, Perirure, because it was very dangerous. And she was the only one who surfs there. And there was a man who were living here, He says uh, he was the chief of the Hupo. He was jealous and he, one day he says that um, he's going to kill her because he thought that if he kills her, maybe he will have her power and he could surf over there. So one night he killed that girl and he tried to surf over there. He did not manage at all. And not long after, his best friend killed, her, killed him. Yeah. So he did not get anything. I basically discovered Chopo um, f hearing from three brothers who, who's been the pioneer of the spot. They, the fam their family name is called Farere, and they, they're from uh, Vairao, big passes. It's about 10 minutes before Chopo, and they used to ride Chopo in the, I would say in the early 80s. Eh? Since 1982, I've been Chopo. No, it was me who Chopo. Parce que lui, il, il voulait pas aller avant. Donc. Et quand j'ai amené le petit frère avant, c'est là après ça a fait le dix clics. Parce que là, en tout cas, quand je vais prendre la première vague là-bas, là, c'était une ouest. Incroyable. Hein? Chopo, it was just called the end of the road back then. And guys only really surfed it when the waves were little. As soon as it got big and started doing that weird thing, they just thought it was too big. I used to go out there when I was 16, 17, jump in my tiny boat by myself and drive to Chopo and get there would be six to eight foot, just perfect, every wave speed and stuff, but nobody out there to surf with. I used to get scared, like look around for like half an hour, like yeah, somebody's gonna turn up and we're gonna surf together and didn't know where to put my tiny and I was like, fuck, I'm by myself, that's a bit heavy, it's, it's quite big and get really scared and then come back and surf at the front here. <laughs> Yeah, there were locals um, when we first went down there. Uh, Timothy and uh, a few bodyboarders, and then Bobby, um, Poto's brother, Moana and Poto. So there was a few guys. There wasn't a, a huge amount of people. Uh, international guys, there was only maybe a few. Maybe it was uh, Mike Stewart and a couple of different guys had actually been there. Uh, first time I went to Tahiti in 1985, uh, 
walk to the end of the road. We were staying out in Vidal, and I uh, just walked to the end of the road and saw this kind spitting mess at the end of the reef. And at that time, from the beach, it didn't really look too rideable. Probably about uh, four or five years later, I went back down there. Um, we were, went down for a PSAA contest and uh, uh, had a zodiac and did a lot of exploration along the coast over there. Found the wave on the way back and, um, you know, had been surfing other spots but weren't as good and then kind of came across that spot and it was pretty insane. So that's kind of how we, we originally found it. Stuart kind of found it, surfed it, showed it to Ben Severson. Ben Severson took Hank. A week later, he took me, and that was kind of it. And then once the Eric Barton wave was on the cover of Surfing, Hank shot, that kind of opened it up. That's when everybody started to see the potential of what it could really do. When the water unloads on that reef, it just, I mean, you can just feel the raw energy and you feel, you feel close to God. Chopu's like this Garden of Eden and this beautiful, like, uh, just serene, most beautiful, most raw place in the world like, that I've ever been to. And, and, and all of a sudden, it will just come alive out of the middle of nowhere. You can't see this wave coming and it'll deliver one of the most serious, the most serious wave you've ever seen down the reef like a guillotine. It was an incredible way that, uh, you know, it was really formed by breaking the reef, you know, off of uh, Tahiti there. And the fresh water, I think, coming out of that entire valley, you know, prevents the coral from really growing in certain areas. So it seems like it just cut a knife through this portion of the reef. And as we know with, you know, good surf, you know, good surf is found around irregularities in the bottom contours, you know, whether it be big waves or small waves or point breaks. And certainly Chopu is the type of a reef that, you know, has got a big major cut in it. Now the wave, when it moves over the shallow part of the reef, is moving much slower, so it stands up and kind of stops. Whereas the part of the wave moving in over the deep water, you know, is still moving faster. So it's kind of like a whip where it just, you know, just hooks around and focuses in towards the shallow water of the reef. It just piles up on itself. That creates that, you know, that huge ledge effect there where there's, there's no back to the wave where the whole ocean appears to be just dumping on this concrete slab. The bottom contours at Chopu are pretty uh, extreme. Obviously it goes from like 150 feet deep just up to about three feet deep in a heartbeat. You know, just in about a, you know, 100 yards or so. So the wave just like stands up out of deep water and you really don't see it coming. And, uh, you know, it's that variance of uh, depth of water contours, which is really the magic of Chopu. A normal wave will peak up, will hit the shallow water and peak. Whereas Chopu seems to draw off the reef and actually draws below sea level. 
It seems to uh, prefer, you know, swells a little bit more out of the straight south as it's, you know, kind of like on the southwest facing shore of, uh, of Tahiti. But, um, you know, the south swells, when they come in out of the straight south, they seem to run down the reef a little bit better, you know, connect a little bit better. And actually there's an indicator further to the south that the guys say that they can see the sets coming. You know, they'll hit that other reef, top of the reef, you know, further up, and then the sets will come down to the, the main break right there. Whereas the southwest swell, you know, hits the reef a little bit more square, where you don't really see this, the sets coming. They just kind of stand up out of nowhere because you're not getting that little advance warning up there at the top of the reef. So the southwest sets are, are a little bit spooky, you know, because you'd be out there in deep water, all of a sudden you got a 20-foot wave on the top end. It's such a beautiful wave just for its raw power. Just it, it demands attention. It's just insane. It's just you can't. I mean, you could have a bomb going off behind you, and if the set's coming, you're probably gonna sit there and look at that set because it's just that. It's, it's insane. But when you get out there, it's a totally different perspective, you know? You get a late drop, kind of you get air on the drop, and it gets pretty heavy out there. Uh, people are not used to the, to the late drops and, uh, and how the waves bends um, 45 degrees at you and barrels over your head. Just got to not hesitate. I think that's the most important thing. That's what I try, try to avoid the most. Any hesitation or any, you know, if you see the wave and you think you want it, you've got to go and really put yourself in the right position and paddle hard. You know, in, you have to tell yourself over and over again that you're doing the right thing. This is a good wave, you know. And uh, when you do get to your feet, you know, it's that that sliding down the face, and you just you can't recreate that anywhere. You know, that feeling of just you're you're so weightless and the fins are above your head and you're pushing down to really get down the face. And uh, there's a moment where your board is completely just, it's not, it's not a grabbing on anything. If you're lucky, you, you know, your fins grab and you, you, you come through that section. That first section sort of might be not as wide, but it runs down and almost bends on the end of the reef. Like you can see it kind of bending around as you go through and you kind of try and weave that first section and then then it goes into just a gaping cabin, and that's the bit that can be a little bit tricky. It can suck you down, or you know, you want to try and get get through that bit if you can get on just on the edge of the foam ball and it'll spit you out. The sound that comes out with the spit behind you as it pushes you out is just ridiculous. It's like this crazy roar. Someone that's gonna come and search Chopo wouldn't need much advice of me because he'd better be really good. It's not a wave to, for beginners. It's, uh, you have to be very good technically and know what you're doing. I always say, like, when I'm talking to guys that are going to surf it for their first time, I'm like, just commit to it. Because if you commit to it, it'll, it'll, it'll spit you out every single time. Don't even worry about what's happening on the rest of the wave because it'll do its part. If you do your part, it will do its part every time. It takes a special surfer to surf that wave. You'll see the you'll see the lineup now, and there's 12 guys sitting in there. And when those waves come, the really really mental waves come. There's there's only a couple guys that will they'll sit there and they'll wait on the ledge right where they're supposed to wait and dig in and do it. There's only a few guys. I mean, you can watch the footage, and there's just guys for the horizon. And there's a couple guys that will sit there on the ledge, and it's blind faith. By all accounts, they should just be getting annihilated. Just 
heads torn off, but they have faith in the fact that that wave is going to do exactly what it's supposed to do, and it does. Chopu, in fact, is so far out of bounds <laughs> that I think it weeds out the people who are out there for the wrong reasons. I think that the consequences are so real. It looks so evil. Chopo will probably do whatever it wants to you. I'm sure the lip has enough power itself to take some of your limbs off. Like, it could take your head off just a lip alone, and then you got the reef to deal with. So, you're definitely in God's hands out there. I always just think about getting caught inside, and that's like the, my worst feeling is being caught inside on a huge one and having that right come at you. I always think about that, and I just go, oh, I hope that doesn't happen, you know. If you do get caught inside, you know something bad's gonna happen. After surfing for so long, you see a wave that's about to break in front of you, and uh, you have an idea from other experiences what that's going to feel like, you know? And uh, so you kind of go down and hold your breath, and you go, okay, here we go. I would say that it's literally three times as bad as you expected every time. In such shallow water, when you get cleaned up, you know, compared to the, relative to the size of the wave or the height of the wave, that when the wave hits you, all you want to do is swim up into it. Because all the white water clouds are hitting the bottom full force anyways. So you don't want to be down near the bottom when it hits you, you know, you'd rather be up and hope that you can, get, you can kind of step in the turbulence a little bit. When I get caught inside, I, I used to make the mistake of trying to paddle towards the shoulder, and it gets bigger and turns at the shoulder. 
all you ever feel like then is that you just have a bullseye in your head and it's just zeroing in on you. If you paddle the opposite way onto the reef, um, generally the wave just kind of breaks real hard and will blow you over the reef and you know it sucks, but uh, you're safe. Nico Paderutz uh, really came unstuck. It was only about a six foot day, and, uh, but he got drifted along the reef and he ended up on the reef in front of the right hand to close out. Nobody wants that right hander, you know, comes towards you. Just, it's, it's gnarly, it's just too much. He got leg rope caught around the reef. We could see from the scaffolding, we could just see his helmet trying to get up. The only way I came out because my helmet was green. <laughs> and the jet ski saw me and said, look, there's a green thing out there, you know? And Nico got up and he was really, really dazed. His eyes were going back in the back of his head and he was white. If I didn't have my helmet, my head would be in a half and people wouldn't even probably see me anymore. He came through and then he went into shock mode and then uh, I remember Nico started, he was crying and talking about his wife and kids and you know, he was really scared. It was, it was a really tough situation. I had to put lemons all over my body. It was maybe the worst pain ever in my life. I don't deserve my life to a $30,000. <laughs> I have so much more in my life. Even my kid has to grow and figure that his dad was someone. Yeah, well, Neko, he was like, he's one very lucky guy that, you know, they managed to actually get him out. Um, there's been other guys that haven't been so lucky, you know, like Bryce Tara, the local guy. Every day at Chopu, it can be eight feet, there'll be a 12 foot set that'll just come through. It can be six feet, there'll be an eight foot set come through. That happened with Bryce, he got caught inside, it caught everybody inside, threw his board, and about five minutes later, they found him tombstoning about, you know, uh, 300 metres down from the spot, and they pulled him in a boat, and. Garrett McNamara was trying to save him. It was, it was really dramatic. Major face, face injuries, the biggest hole I've ever seen right there. And even broken neck bone, severed spine. His head was, he had some injuries, injuries to his head. And I had to work on him for 20 minutes. Basically, I had his blood on me from head to toe and I had cuts, so his blood was in my blood, and it was heavy. I still came back two years later, and I could feel his presence out there helping me out, so I don't, I'm not really afraid out there. Um, the yeah, first year they held the event there, the Black Pearl Hurry Pro. And you now the waves weren't that good, I suppose you got four to six foot, but uh, I suppose the most eventful thing was the boat running aground on the reef. They had the judges on this multi-million dollar cruiser, the Amoretti I think it was called, and um, 
sure enough, the pad had parked in the channel, the squall's come through, it's, like, it's dragged its anchor and the thing's ended up fair square on the reef, probably the worst bit of reef in the world you could run a multi-million dollar cruiser on, and it's ended up fair square stuck on it, and um, it was like bloody Gilligan's Island, women and children first. <laughs> So by the end of the event, it, it kind of actually turned into a bit of a farce with the uh, with the boat running aground, and you know, they had insult to injury. Then the uh, you know they ended up short of prize money at the end. I don't know exactly what happened, but uh, there was no money to pay anyone, which didn't actually go down too well with the surfers, funnily enough. Yeah. So the second year they held the event in '98, um, the big year. That was, you know, we'd heard while the contest was going on that there was that they'd actually got pretty serious waves, and there was you know, and the guys were kind of freaking out a little, but. You know, there was no webcast at the time, so we didn't know what was happening. So incredible to sit there and be close and to see it like perfect mother nature, you know, like this and just, I mean, you look and you think, okay, I, what if I was on the wave, you know? Just fucking woo! It was just, oh, it was incredible. It was like, yeah. really, and everybody woo, you know. kind of shocked the shit out of everyone. No one had ever seen anything like that. And this, you know, this pokey little event in the uh, in the far corner of the world suddenly was kind of launched on the world stage and you know, everyone could see the potential for it. And uh, you know, sure enough, within 12 months, it was a, a WCT event. <laughs> So my first trip to Tahiti was when the event uh, became a WCT, and that, that was in 1999. And we arrived here just as they finishing the trials, and the first impression was, uh, wow, the place is like no other. The tower we were supposed to judge from, as soon as we arrived here, the day before the event starts, fell over. And um, we had to go to emergency plan, and nobody was actually expecting what to do, and we ended up judging from the boat, first boat in the lineup. Steve Fuchs was then the head judge, and he was given this whistle to advise everybody, the peanut gallery in front of the boat, that a set was coming, and we had to sprint the boat forward to, in order to make the wave. And this gigantic set just started looming, and as the boat driver is back in the boat, and Fuxi, terrorized, is trying to blow this whistle and nothing was coming out of his mouth. <laughs> Barely made over the first one, whole nose of the boat out of the water, splashing away back, the tail lifting. It was amazing, you know. By the year 2000, you know, um, the event was huge. Everyone had seen, you know, two or three years of amazing, you know, death-defying pits, and um, and on the world stage, it was basically the biggest contest in the world. Billabong realised that in 2001, stepped in and secured a four-year sponsorship, which I think they've just renewed actually for another four years. If you can't walk the walk, don't talk. Don't talk. Yeah, the Billabong Pro at the Opu here in Tahiti is running in an absolutely extreme environment. It's like a mini circus on the water out there. And you tell me where else you can go and get a professional athlete coming out of a 12 to 15 foot monster of a wave. And as he or she finishes their waves, they go and finish their ride, I should say, around a boat giving everyone high fives in the boat. That to me sums up uh, Te Opu. The surfers come here and they, they the first thing they, they want to know is are they going to be looked after? If something inadvertently happens, what has Billabong got in place to sort of look after them? If something happens, we've got the Tahitian Water Patrol, we've got all the medical things in place. Yeah, Chopo is definitely one of those places where you feel a lot more comfortable having the Water Patrol. Because, you know, just being in the wrong place at the wrong time can cost you your life. 
we have to sort of work out with Toto, who's in the water usually, and Chris at Callahan, who's you know the contest director there, and we've got a big old gauge on whether it is possible for the surfers to paddle into the waves. And we normally find that once it starts getting over 12 foot plus with a west swell, that's nearly impossible. So far during the competition, there hasn't been anything that's been totally major. But you know, you get the feeling that it's you know you're only one contest away from the real tragedy. Um, my arm grabbed and it was kind of like more like concrete than water. It just grabbed and it felt like I smashed it into the ground. It was just like just my arm went hyper extended way up that way and just ripped out of the socket. Before I knew I was underwater and trying to get up and I only had one arm to use, I was just like, thank God it wasn't all that big and I got out of trouble pretty easily, but yeah, it was, it was pretty dramatic and pretty sort of tragic at the time. Oh, I think this wave is, is, is vital to the tour. I think that we, we as the best surfers in the world really have to try and prove ourselves in some of the heaviest waves. I mean, we've, we've got to, really got to have an event there just to try and, you know, just show that we'll showcase professional surfing, that we can surf waves like this. I mean, there's been amazing contests out there. If there was ever a place that was built for men on men, it's Chopu. You see guys coming out of there who, they literally make names for themselves in, in, in one session. It, it's, it's amazing for guys' careers. It's got to be the premier event on tour, you know, just when it comes down to, you know, big wave and barrels. It's, it's one of those places where everyone wants to win at. It's a, a place where, along the year, you remember who won contests like that. emotions when we all go to Chopu. Uh, some girls hate it, some girls love it, some girls love to hate it. It's just a matter of confronting your fears and accepting the challenge and, and having a go. And I, I know a lot of the girls really love to go there. I think the women are, are really challenging themselves by going out there now. Oh, well, I mean, obviously, you know, on those uh, 8 to 12 foot days, 8 to 10 foot days, it's, it's I don't think, I think it is beyond the girls, and, and I think they'll readily admit that. Um, Kiala will go, I mean, she's mad, she takes off on anything, and she, you know, she, she, take, she makes a lot, but she takes gas on a lot too. You really have to be completely committed. It's really all about throwing yourself over a ledge, because that's basically what you gotta do. I mean, you can't even really look at the bottom of the wave, you just really have to just throw yourself out over the ledge and, and, and cross your fingers and pray. <laughs> I think there's been a couple of times when they've been put in in skitzy conditions. That one year when we went there, I was on online and then that was the same year that kid got his head ripped off pretty much from his body and it was like, great, you know, <laughs> what are we doing surfing the wave like this? For me, like if I wanted to surf someplace like that and do well, I definitely want the hours to put in to, to, to figure it out. For me, like free surfing out there, it was a matter of just getting out of everyone's way because there's always a guy checking out deep. It was just frantic. It was just hard to even practice or train out there. But um, the last heat I had was a semifinal with Lane, and um, I got caught inside pretty bad. And in this round, I had, had Brian Kailana, you know, pull me up on my jersey. And, and for me, that was it. That was my goodbye. See ya. I'm not coming back. <laughs> I think women surfing needs Chopu. I think it, it gives us the credibility and the respect that we deserve by putting us out in such a challenging location. I think the guys show us more respect and the world takes notice when the girls charge out there. So I think it's a fantastic opportunity to promote women's surfing, to put it on that main stage. And looking at the young girls that are up and coming, they've all got the ability to surf it. So uh, I think it's in safe hands that event will remain on the women's tour for a long time.
I would say over 12 foot wave, it's very hard to paddle into it. There's only a few, a few men who could do it, you know? gets to the point where you just can't match the speed of the wave. Um, you think, no matter what, I've got this one easily, and it just sucks you up the face. And when that starts happening to guys, it becomes pretty apparent that the only way you're going to ride the sets is to tow, tow into them. Yeah, this is a Yamaha 1200, 150 horsepower. Got, it's a two-stroke. Um, I think the more power you get, the better it is to outrun the wave, I would say. This board looks probably like a normal board, but it's five times heavier than a normal board. And it's narrow and thinner. Got the, a lot of concave on the tail with uh, some aluminum fins on it to go faster. A choke board, the wave is so hollow. That what the, what the curve of the wave is, it's so small. It, with a bigger board, I noticed that you kind of like get stuck and almost pearl catch a rail. So it's, I noticed in the future, I'll, I'll ride a shorter board for Chopo. A 510 would be great. I think when you get towed in, it takes out the, the intensity or that rush or adrenaline rush but it adds like a little more enjoyability because uh, you get yanked in and you don't have to think about the drop. You just basically get to enjoy the wave. And uh, I just think it's, it's kind of cool in that regard. But I guess once it's over the 12 foot range, it more or less is, it's all big, it's all gnarly and the adrenaline comes back. the wave, you know, you think you're going to be trapped in the barrel and you're turning toward the beach. And uh, it's the most challenging wave, I think, in the world for, for simply because of the reef and, and what you're up against if you fall. Obviously, Laird's wave back in August um, 2000 was um, really the, the, the first big, big swell and, um, uh, you know, first photo that kind of went all around the world. One of the better moments in surfing history, and I'm sure Laird can go look back on it and know that it was a pinnacle moment perfectly captured. You know, there were two big sets, and um, one was obviously way bigger than everything we'd ever seen out there. Laird's wave was like the beginning of the new century, showing us what was to come, you know? 
it's just like the beginning of of crazier, crazier things that are gonna come. And we're, we just gotta wait and see how it's gonna go. Tuesday, 29th of April. We have some big swell on the way for Tahiti. Been looking at the synoptic maps for the last couple of days. We've got a, a low pressure system that's just developed off the coast of New Zealand in the last couple of days. It dropped down to, to 961 hectopascals. It's a really, really strong low pressure system. And the winds are up around 50 or 60 knots on the western side. And that's just aimed straight up in the swell window towards Tahiti. So we're gonna see some really, really big waves. And the swell charts just pretty much tell the story. We've had up to 35 feet of open ocean swell. And it's just moving northeast, right up towards Tahiti as we speak. And so if we can get this sort of 20 foot swell maybe and a lot of south in it, we're going to see some great towing surfing for sure. <laughs> I'm telling you, it's going to be perfect. It's going to be big. I'm serious. Early in the morning it was small. Yeah, where are the waves? It's, it was pumping yesterday afternoon. And now it's, you know, it's only like four foot, four or five foot. It's kind of playful almost, you know. started coming up and it started to get a little bit you know, sketchy on the weather but we thought, well, we'll just hang out because it went good yesterday you know, so maybe it'll do it again today and sure enough uh, come around midday all the paddling surfers are just getting left behind the towing guys are moving in And it just got kept on getting bigger and the light got cleaner and all manner of guys were out there having a go at it and, and you know it was just outrageous. By the end of the day it was just outright crazy. You'd see surfers from the boat angle, you'd be shooting them, and then the boat, the waves pass you by, and it'd be like looking down like five stories. What we see is not always one. Well, no, Drillette, he got, a, he got this one wave. The thing spat about five bathtubs full of water on him.
side of this towed into a monster and it closed out on me. That much forest just cheese grating you could rip your legs off and your feet and your head and everything. I mean, I even ripped my groin, I almost ripped my little guy off, man. It just like cuts down my inside of my thighs and my groin. The Tahitians were just incredible. They're just the way that they attacked this way with absolutely no fear, complete style. It's like I've, they've just made their mark in history after that day. I, I, I never towed in before, so I was just kind of cruising watching, and uh, you know, all those guys, you, know, you can only ride so many waves like that, and I think that, you know, Ramana had his fill, and the other boys had their fill, and, and uh, you know, Ramana asked me if I wanted to catch a wave, and, and I was like, sure, you know. And... Sitting next to him in the boat while he was fingernailing his wax, and, you know, just sort of keeping a, a check on his equipment and fins, and, you know, I saw him sort of really looking over his board with, you know, a fine comb, and I was like, Where's he going with that? Yeah, I, I've never towed in on a tow board, so I, uh, I wasn't comfortable doing it. I choke it when you're towing in. You don't really go that far out, as I guess like waves like Jaws and stuff, where they catch the wave from farther out. Choke is such a condensed little area. Um, you're only sitting you know, a couple hundred yards outside the peak. And once you see that set coming, you just fire up and, and whip right into the little zone. I was personally scared for him. He didn't have any foot strap, and I'm sure if he would have fallen there, um, it would have been a big mistake. That wave of Corey is just absolutely crazy. If you see it on film, the way he's riding it, and you can see how the you can really get a feel for how the chops and the bumps and suck on the wave affects affects how you ride it. And you can see that like, man, that guy needed some straps. I was watching Corey take off and ride with no straps. I was watching Terry Dominique like do, th you know, above the fall line just riding backside. Manoa, Gillette, Bruce Irons. I was just watching everybody just, just, I was taken back. I was going, there's no way. Sat in the boat and Poto just kept jeering me up. Come on, Joel, it's your turn. I uh, borrowed Jamie Sterling's board and headed out for a couple of waves and the first few rides were pretty unpredictable. Joel Fitz had just caught a wave and I remember seeing him go down and, and, and the wave actually went right below the roof. You could see the water flying off the edge of the reef and down into the into the vertical whirlpool. You're just like, oh my God, and the, the whole sky just turns blue from this lip just coming over your head. And all you're thinking is, God, get me out of here, please. You know, all you want to do is just go home and hide under your bed. And then the wave uh, that came through for Malik we were circling around outside and there was a bit of jockeying going on and uh, the boys from Tahiti come through uh, with uh, inside priority and uh, he got the ride of his life, so. I almost catch that wave because I give the rope to Malik and I said he didn't want to go at the beginning, he said, uh, because he was scared. And then uh, I said to him, take the rope, take the rope, somebody's gonna take it, take the rope. And then finally he jumped out.
So I put on the jacket, grabbed the board, went out, we waited like for like five or ten minutes, and then this uh, this set com came in. I looked at it, and the man looked at me. He goes, "Okay, this one." I go, "Okay, let's go." He was gonna let it go, and then his partner looked at him and said, "No, no, no! Wait, wait!" A few seconds later, his partner went, "Go!" Let go the rope, went down the face. When I got to the bottom, I saw the boats, all the boats were going, so I said, oh, I hope it's not closing out. Yeah. And then I looked up and I couldn't see the top of the wave and I was like, please don't close out. The thing just spit for like two seconds and then I, like just so much white water above me, then everything fell down, I couldn't see anything. So uh, I saw the little exit up there and I tried to climb up the face and jump off the back. And uh, <laughs> it was uh, intense. Heaviest thing I've ever seen in my life. It was just humongous. Those two two days were pretty much up there with the, the pinnacle of my surfing career. That day definitely changed surfing for the rest of for the rest of time. You know, the day of days, I suppose you'd want to call it, and it was just horrendously big. The ground was shaking on the on the point. You could hear the ground shaking. You know, you feel the ground shaking. You could hear the cracks on the reef. It was like it was like lightning thunder, you know, lightning and thunder right through the night. Scary stuff. You know, it, it was, the ocean was just unloading. You know, there was a set every five minutes almost. It just was non-stop. You know, a swell like that, it, there wasn't long intervals really. It just kept pumping and pumping. There were so many epic waves that day. I mean, apparently it was like it pumped more than any of the other big days I've had there in recent years. And, Every wave was huge, every wave was massive, and there was plenty of them that were just pumping. It was like constant. My 20 years of surfing experience, I would say that it's the most fastest swell I've ever seen. In two hours, it was 10 to 20 foot in two hours. To be, to be able to, to, to be at Tropa on a big day and basically be in a channel on the boat or, or swimming and, and watching people taking off on those those big barrels, it's, there's nothing like that in the world. I think it's a blessing from God. And then by the end of the afternoon, it was huge. Like, it was the biggest I've been out there. About four or five, it got all messed up. It's too big, it was too big, too much water moving. Well, some wave was dry. And the wave breaking like a shore break. <laughs> And I was here and I heard a big swell was coming, but I had no idea it was gonna be that big. Like, I was thinking, ah, you know, 12 to 15 feet. I wasn't thinking it was gonna be like, how big it got. So, yeah, that, 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 those are the biggest 
heaviest waves I've ever seen in my life. That day there was, yeah, there were really some mean looking waves just dredging and that just looked look not nice at all. You know, usually Chopu, you're just fascinated by the perfection of the tube, but uh, at that size, the tube just starts warping and it, it becomes, you know, pretty hideous and scary. Yeah, everybody that had a go really, you know, they really proved themselves and really have uh, earned a spot, I would think, to surf there. You know, I'm honoured to, to be here for that swell and just honoured to, to take part in that surf session because it's a, it's a surf session that, it won't, that will never be forgotten. It will always be, be etched in our minds forever, I'm sure. It's a historical day in surfing. You know, the Tahitian locals were calling it the biggest day ever ridden at Chopo. It's when you're that close to death, you realize how good life is. And there were so many guys out there who were that close. I mean, just to commit to go onto one wave at all, just one wave was to be that close. And I, it's just it's so wonderful that it all came together and everybody was okay. I mean, it, it, could, it could rip you to pieces out there. It probably should have claimed my life. So I was thinking that might be uh, the end of Joel Fitzgerald. On a big wave, on a big wave you can die, I think. You know? Somebody's gonna die, huh? Because it's been too easy for the last few years. Nobody got hurt. We never talk about people got hurt. Uh, that's about the only day that I really surfed that trip. Just a, a, you know, a few waves, a dozen or so waves, and basically I spent the rest of the trip like everybody else in the lagoon with a six pack and some rollies. <laughs> you know, you just the limits get pushed every year. We see someone do something, you know, incredible, and there's more to come. I reckon some guys are going to start doing more stuff out here that's just going to blow the surfing world away.